Uh, this lecture, which is the, uh, it's going to actually form part of six lectures focusing on the root causes of our society's problems, uh, looking at the mechanisms. No, no, sadly not. No, they will be uh, six one-hour lectures. Um, they'll be available online. They're, they're really to give people a sense of idea of how our movement came about, because the fundamental root causes that have informed our worldviews are not to be summed up in a nice kind of ten-minute elevator speech. So this is the first one, and. As this obviously is already telling you, uh, this one focuses on the monetary system specifically. Uh, it should be noted that a uh, complete understanding of the tenets, social goals and understandings of the movement I represent can't be achieved through this lecture alone, but I think it will be a very useful starting point. Uh, and I hope that by the end of today, um, if anything, you will have a, a look at some of the societal constructs that affect us every day with, with fresh eyes. So, uh, before I begin, a word on the two organizations that I speak on behalf of. I'm primarily a member of the Zeitgeist Movement, a global decentralized grassroots organization founded at the very end of 2008. Uh, the term Zeitgeist uh, means the dominant intellectual, moral, and cultural climate of an era. Uh, the closest transliteration is the German is uh, spirit of the age. Uh, the term movement simply denotes motion or change. As such, the Zeitgeist movement calls for a change in the dominant intellectual, cultural, and moral climate of the time. The uh, Zeitgeist movement is an activist and communications arm of another much older organization called the Venus Project, which, under the direction of Jacques Fresco and his associate Roxanne Meadows, has focused on the technological redesign of an entirely new social system known as a resource-based economy. At its core, the application of the current state of science and technology for social concerns is uh, using the scientific method and practicality to maximize the quality of life for all people. This is to be achieved through tangible solutions to our problems we face instead of hollow rhetoric and opinion. Our reasoning behind our conclusions are not based on political opinion, nor are they idle speculation, nor are they stopgap measures to treat the symptoms of a society as a psychiatrist will treat a psychological aftermath of a patient's experiences. We would rather minimize and, if possible, wholly preclude the situations that got the patient in front of the psychiatrist in the first place. Our main focus, therefore, is to pinpoint the root causes of these ill effects and to propose straightforward, concrete solutions based on the inferential logic and the scientific method and applied for global concern holistically. I wanted to address in the introduction some common barriers we have when it comes to the analysis of uh, economics in our current society. In today's world, many of us question the institutions we're brought up in and by which we're influenced. In fact, it's become a slightly more promoted disposition that questioning authority is healthy uh, than in prior human history. After all, questioning religion uh, no longer is tantamount to being burnt at the stake. And uh, the development and adoption of the scientific method has allowed humanity to update and revise its knowledge of the physical world by systematically adopting a viewpoint of skepticism uh, while hypotheses are tested and until they are proven true or false and adopted or not. Indeed, any and all social protest is essentially a questioning and a conscious rejection of some pre-existing or presented framework. Yet, of all the institutions uh, common across the globe, be they political, social, religious or national in origin, none has remained so thoroughly unquestioned and beyond even the most basic analysis or understanding by most people uh, than the monetary system itself. Even as the system of monetary finance is displacing more than six million American homeowners and half the world's six billion people are now uh, classed as suffering through poverty, one billion starving, uh, a figure that is up, by the way, by 80 million since the early 1990s, uh, the system remains unscrutinized despite its global presence. Here are some reasons why. Economics is often viewed as rather dull and abstract a subject. In fact, I'm amazed you're even all here today. Uh, financial news tends to be presented and dominated by complex-looking graphs, uh, which don't allow for any real understanding of the subject being discussed, silently promoting the idea that this is an area best left to the experts, to well-paid economists and bankers. Abstract terms like derivatives, mortgage-backed securities, and strangely named institutions like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are not only hard concepts for me, I don't encounter these abstractions in real life. No one has ever sold me a mortgage-backed security. I've never been contacted by Fanny or Freddie, and I'm sure it's uh, taken quite a few days for some people other than myself uh, to even catch on to the fact that these aren't even real people. Uh, they're institutions. 
Um, economics isn't like football. It's not like the physical process of shopping. And even worse, it sounds like it might be about maths. Um, we shy away from this mess of abstract terms and we, f we fear that we might not understand them and suspect that we would dislike them if we did. Others simply don't see a need to question the monetary system. After all, isn't it simply the method by which goods are transferred and so anything that simply represents that method is natural, necessary and will function as dictated by the needs of a populace to earn, buy and survive in their social constructs. We do all rely on resources in some form or other, and since we don't have absolutely everything, uh, and a unified, preferably global exchange mechanism seems the necessary steps uh, in easing any process of acquisition and hence survival. How can it be questioned any more than we question the need for air? For others still, the monetary system which applies to their community and day-to-day -day routine seems to be embedded so heavily in the framework of their lives that it appears not to even be a system at all. It is part of the landscape, invisible to their day-to-day -day lives, exactly because it is a function of their day-to-day -day lives. Like the ancient music of the spheres, uh, which was theorized by ancient philosophers when describing the nature of planets in orbit, it is this ever-present thing from birth and therefore invisible and undetectable. It's not so much that it's hard uh, to single out for people, it's that the very idea of singling it out seems impossible, for it doesn't even occur as a possibility, it doesn't appear as a, a separate entity. Maybe it's also because economics relies on a numerical bias, on uh, mathematics, equations and graphs. It seems therefore likely to be based on logic, measurability, and as true and immutable as those of physics, biochemistry or other sciences. And while elements of physics are questioned, revised and updated upon the receipt of proof, physics itself remains entirely intact. In fact, once revisions and corrections are made, physics has, has itself become a more established entity than it was before. Yet, as we'll find later on, not only are the supposed laws of economics not only based on no real-life reference whatsoever, when the analysis of the processes of money creation, its tangible negative effects upon society and the behaviours it instills upon and encourages in members of society, one sees that there is almost nothing in the system of modern economics as it now stands that is of any real value to our process and well-being. And yet the most powerful force that has, been, has rendered the system of economics as it stands now beyond analysis is this closed-door brotherhood of the initiated guardians of the status quo who form the population of modern economics. Authorities, credentialed econ economists trained uh, by the already established institutional logic, CEOs and other lofty and well-paid positions. These are the men and women who should be dealing with economics, not average Joes like myself, right? Well, let me remind you that uh, throughout the glorious period of history known as the Dark Ages, precisely this mechanism of initiation and separation was employed by the church to avoid its institutional power being questioned and to keep education, anything it deemed a threat to its establishment or even reading out of the reach of the remaining inhabitants of that socio-cultural landscape. This sentiment is particularly well expressed by John McMurtry, author of The Cancer Stage of Capitalism, who uh, writes, We might say that economics is to the corporate market what theology was to the medieval church. Just as ancient Latin operated in the medieval church to reify dogmas into ritualized sequences, untouchable by the vulgar passage of time, so econometrics functions in today's economics. It conceals the value judgments it assumes in an atemporal algebraic apparatus that is severed from natural language, living reference, and the accountability to its effects. It's a remarkable book. This, however, is changing. And it's changing quite rapidly, much quicker than I actually thought it would, uh, given all of the above reasons why we don't tend to uh, lock in and engage in questioning of this system. Uh, in researching this monetary system, I have many a time carried with me large and boring looking books detailing the history of finance and the way it operates today, um, which does mean wading through thousands of pages of literature. Uh, one evening in a bar, no less than three unrelated strangers asked me what my book was about. Uh, I've been approached on the underground, that standard haven of uncomfortable silence, uh, by strangers asking me not only what is the book about, but even asking me upon hearing my relatively brief three-minute elevator talk summary of it, uh, what, the, what the answer might be to our problems raised. And more and more people are beginning to agree that not only 
uh, on the problem when they see that w when they are presented with the simple facts but upon the solution as well people aren't stupid they know something's up and they think it uh, it might just be something other than having voted for the wrong politician in the last election all I wish to do today is to have that same London Underground conversation with you. It's time to question the system that in recent years has become notable by its failure and its damage. First off, the assumption that monetary economics is too complex for normal people like us to understand is completely erroneous. Nor is it a natural part of society anymore, although, as we'll see, it once was and served fairly interesting functions. And once you understand the methods by which modern finance is operated worldwide, you will understand the dire need to question every aspect of this vast, all-encompassing system and its validity. So, in order to provide an understanding of economics as it presently affects us, it is necessary to give a brief history of, uh, kind of the history of money. Contrary to popular belief, uh, it is very new in the human race's history. Um, ostensibly, the rationale for money uh, at all existed in ancient times to manage scarcity in order to ensure that enough labor was contributed to a social system and that it was proportional to the natural resources that people then extracted out of that system they were in. Coined money appeared around 1500 BC, possibly earlier, and many credit the Lydians with introducing gold and silver coined money. This coin money system is termed commodity money, being formed or created out of a good or material that is perceived as valuable or has some tangible use. And while there are two materials we would commonly associate with this, uh, being gold and silver, in fact many materials uh, or objects have been used as uh, a base commodity value, such as copper, another familiar one still used today, salt, peppercorns, which pretty much takes care of restaurants, doesn't it? Um, large stones, uh, decorated belts, uh, shells, the Far East used to uh, shells quite a lot. Uh, alcohol, cigarettes, which makes me a millionaire. Uh, chocolate and candy generally, and uh, barley, and my favorite one, weed. Uh, this one's particularly interesting. Uh, one can only surmise as to how much more peaceful and yet massively unproductive and pizza consuming the world would be if there were a commodity currency of the globe made of weed. Yet one might also suspect that a downside to the cannabis-based monetary system would be hyperdeflation. The next step of monetary evolution was to representative or receipt money, a sort of meta-money, if you will. This representative money derived from promissory notes or receipts issued by goldsmiths to individuals who deposited their gold, which had become the dominant uh, commodity money, uh, for safekeeping in the goldsmith safe when it became too much to carry or to ensure security of their stash. As trade between the populace picked up, or whenever someone came into a lot of wealth, carrying around large sacks of gold or any other precious metal became cumbersome and heavy. Depositing it in the goldsmith's safe is much safer. I wonder which one of those words came first. Not only that, the goldsmith issued promissory notes to enable someone to easily pick up their gold when needed. These promissory notes uh, from the goldsmiths were essentially receipts for the amount that they had uh, been deposited and thus were essentially still backed 100% by the known value, uh, an equal value to the face value of that receipt, of course. This receipt here is actually English. It comes from 1774, although I must point out it does also specify interest, so that doesn't quite fit into uh, the order I'm doing things, but it is a fairly good example. People began directly trading this, these receipts in the marketplace uh, instead of going to their goldsmith, removing the gold from the vault, and then using that to buy goods. Um, essentially, uh, it's a swap of IOUs, all backed by the goldsmith's stash, uh, for any good or service that's required. Uh, around this time, the promissory notes were adorned with the phrase that you'll be aware of if you've ever looked at the money that we actually use today, the promise to pay uh, the bearer on demand the sum of. Essentially, the bearer of the note was able to lay claim to the gold in the vault due to the ownership of the promissory note in his or her possession, so they were naturally transferable, very much like uh, the original um, you know, shells and belts and, and Snickers bars and all the other stuff that we used. The immediate effect of this was that very few people actually removed their gold from the vaults, and this is absolutely key in the history of finance. Trade was abstracted to the level of paper representations. The goldsmith, already earning a proportion of the gold stored via vault rental costs to store the gold in the first place, realized he now possessed a large amount of gold on a near permanent basis, which was just sitting there. On average, just 10% of the gold was ever removed or redeemed by the people bearing any notes at any time, meaning that the goldsmith could safely lend up to 90% of the excessive gold without running short, should any of the rightful owners return and demand their actual gold. 
The goldsmith began lending out at uh, interest, doubling up his earnings, essentially profiting off the wealth of others who were already paying rental fees for the alleged safekeeping of this gold, despite the fact that the gold in the safe, already represented by and tied to receipt money, was not available for circulation. G. Edward Griffin, who wrote The Seminal Creature from Jekyll Island, explains this paradoxical scenario through a game of poker. Let's pretend that we all converge on Charlie's house for a poker game, and that upon arrival, each of us hands Charlie a $20 bill. Charlie, acting as a banker, issues each of us 20 poker chips and stuffs the money in an envelope. The agreement is that I may leave the game at any time and exchange each of the chips I possess for $1. Now comes Larry, Charlie's brother, but Larry isn't here to play poker. Larry is in a tight spot and needs to borrow some money. Since eight of us are playing poker, there is a total of $160 in Charlie's envelope, and that turns out to be just exactly what Larry needs. You can well imagine what would happen if Charlie decided to lend out his idle money. It is not available for lending. Neither Charlie nor any of us other players has a right to loan that money out because it is still being held in escrow, so to speak, pending completion of a contract between Charlie and his guests. Those dollars really shouldn't have been con even considered money at this point because the value that they represent has been assigned to the poker chips. If any of us has enough compassion for Larry's plight to want to loan him the money, it must come from other money in our possession, or we turn in our chips and repossess the money in the envelope in order to give Larry that. We could not spend or loan that money in the envelope and still consider the chips to be worth anything. That is the absolute key point to his story. Griffin succinctly sums up the issue. Chips or any other representation are valuable only as abstractions of another value held in escrow until exchanged. The use or reuse of that valued object undermines the value relationship as one does, for example, a one-sided seesaw. The tendency towards undermining this value representation by lending out more than was in reserve uh, to an led to an unpleasant occurrence for the goldsmith. For when the goldsmith became fabulously and ostentatiously wealthy, thanks to the fact that he was now beginning to earn off the interest on someone else's money, those who had placed their gold in reserve were led to believe that perhaps he'd been lending out and spending their gold instead of storing it. Panicking, large numbers of account holders got together and demanded their gold all at once. Obviously, there was not enough to go around. One of two things could happen. The goldsmith could go out of business and, I would imagine, have his cranium forcibly removed, or he could cut them into the deal to prevent going broke and retain their business and, of course, their gold. This was a major shift in uh, the practices of what came to be modern banking. Essentially, it was the shift from vault rental to what we understand to be interest today, as this monthly incremental earning mechanism became applied to both the vault owner as well as the depositor or the account holder. Where did the extra gold come from to pay that? Of course, it came from the people borrowing from the goldsmith. This, then, would become the basis for modern banking, lending out more than that was on hand, and this has led to a third type of money. So we've gone from commodity money through to receipt money, and now we're at fractional money. Uh, essentially, a note backed by only a fraction of its value in reserves and the process by which it is lent to the general public is called fractional reserve banking. Here's how it works, uh, from creation of bank reserves within a commercial bank through to the creation of loans to the general public. So, uh, here's what we're going to walk through, and before I actually start, I should probably quote Alan Greenspan, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, who once said, I guess I should warn you, if I turn out to be particularly clear, you've probably misunderstood what I've said. And he's right. <laughs> Money, contrary to what I thought, is not produced by the government. Here's how it works in the UK. The Central Bank of the United Kingdom is the Bank of England, a privately owned company with exclusive rights to the money supply for the entire UK. Of course, you can write to the Bank of England and ask them if they are privately owned. Of course, they'll tell you they're not. Uh, but uh, even cursory knowledge of history would completely inform you otherwise. It was chartered in 1694, owned by a group of individuals who were never revealed. It was then nationalized in 1946 in that the government bought all the stocks in it. Yet the government didn't have the money to buy it. So, brilliantly, the Bank of England was bought through the use of stocks that bore the burden of interest. In other words, the government borrowed the money to buy the bank from the bank. And it only gets weirder. <laughs> Here's how money is actually created. Here we have, uh, we'll map the creation of 10 billion pounds. Um, so, the Bank of England creates 10... Uh, sorry, 10 million. The Bank of England creates 10 million out of thin air and credits its own account. 
Using this money, it then buys government bonds or corporate bonds from commercial banks uh, or any lending institution. The sale results in the money being deposited in the reserve accounts of financial institutions across the UK, and hey presto, money has been created and distributed to lending institutions. Now, let's say that one of these commercial banks has received uh, 10 million in deposits from the Bank of uh, England. On the basis of this, they lend a couple 10 grand to buy a house. Wishful thinking, perhaps, but nonetheless. Now, it would make sense to assume that the 10 grand lent to the couple came out of the bank's reserves, which already invented money, leaving 9,990,000 pounds. Yet, this is not the case. For... As modern money mechanics puts it, of course, the banks do not lend their depositors money. If they did, no new money would be created. What is modern money mechanics? Is it some communist propaganda? Is it some fringe public publication based on internet research? No, it was published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Instead, the loan is invented on the spot from nowhere based on the wonders of the fractional reserve laws, which demand that, just like the goldsmith, Somewhere in the region of 10% of that amount needs to be backed by the bank's reserves, which in this case, of course, it is, because 10 grand is easily covered by their 10 million reserves. So the couple have borrowed the 10 grand, now deposit it in a rival bank. Uh, that bank, however, can't behave exactly as the first bank, which simply, simply lend, and simply lend out 100 grand based on 10 grand as the 10% uh, deposit rate. What bank two has to do is divide the 10 grand by the reserve requirement itself. So 1,000 becomes the bank's reserves and 9,000 is then lent out as new loans. Does this money come out of the existing 10 grand? No. Once again, it's actually created out of thin air. That 9,000 can then be borrowed and deposited at yet another bank, which can then lend out 8,100 and so on and so on. Every bank in the world does this. Every transaction produces more money to the tune of 90% of its own numerical value, meaning that from 10 grand in loans, you could actually produce 100 grand in completely new money. And if you're already way ahead of me, you might be wondering where the money comes from to pay the interest. For all loans come at interest. Every loan in the process of money creation is at interest, and the commercial banks will eventually have to pay the central bank back at interest as well. Given that you have to pay back more than you borrowed, someone will end up with the short straw and with defaults on payments, mortgages, and so on. This is where the tent cities are coming from in the US and even the UK now. So who creates the money to repay the interest? Yes, it's the banks in the form of new loans. Shout when you see the, the one that you have. Um, even if you are repaying a loan to the bank with the money you're earning from a job, where did that money come from? It was also lent at interest to your employer so your employer could pay you. Or let's say you're selling something you own uh, that someone uh, you sold to, has, that, uh, that someone who you have sold to has borrowed at interest to pay you for the goods or services you provide as well. Every pound, dollar, euro is owed by somebody to somebody else. And the whole lot is ultimately owned to the banks and they are always owed more than was previously created. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a pyramid scheme. Quite simply, it is a massive, massive global Ponzi scheme. It is a game of musical chairs where many people have to lose in order for the flawed logic of the system to be maintained. Wealth is transferred upwards from those with less to those with more by magnifying the level of debt at every new level of the pyramid. And it's actually reinforced by, on another level by the application of interest between accounts. Here's how, and you'll be familiar with this one, it's not new. An account with a million pounds in it will accrue interest. At 5% interest, it'll produce 50 grand in one year. Not from contributions to society uh, that you earn or that, you know, that earn you credits, but from simply having money to begin with. Similarly, a poor person's debt to a bank via an overdraft facility or the need to survive on loans accrues interest. This interest, theoretically, is what is used to pay the interest to the account of the person possessing a million. In other words, the transference of wealth from the poor to the rich is driven by the inherent inequality of the system uh, which is produced in the first place. And with only the very rich, the owners of the system, the commercial, the ultimately central banks, like the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve of the United States, which is another private institution, these are the only true winners. The modern banking system manufactures money out of nothing. The process is perhaps the most astounding sleight of hand that has ever been invented. Those aren't my words. They're the words of Lord Stamp, a Bank of England director in 1937. This is thoroughly recognized by the people who run this system. It is not some secret. It is admitted openly. Ask a banking friend. They'll tell you. So 
What is wrong with this system, other than that it is legalized fraud by a private closed-loop banking cartel based on cloud cuckoo land logic? Apart from that. Well, far more serious than monetary system which generates, encourages, and necessitates debt, servitude, poverty, and ultimately war, to say nothing of the fact uh, that wars are func uh, funded on both sides by exactly the same people, uh, which are essentially the banking cartel. Far worse than this are the side effects of a monetary system when it comes to the fundamentally most important aspect of global societies, and that is the access to and management of the world's natural resources, without which no society would ever flourish or even begin to develop without. So, part three. Uh, this section looks at the use of the prof uh, looks at how the use of profit-based system of exchange actually affects societies in other ways than just purely debt. We've already denoted how money uh, of any kind has historically been employed by a society to manage scarcity of resources. Uh, this is, in fact, the only functionally relevant attribute of a monetary system at all, for it was originally conceived to ensure fair and sustainable balance between what was put in and what comes out of a society. <coughs> and uh, what one can get out to you know, benefit oneself amid the, sp the sparse conditions that uh, we first had when we were hunter-gatherers and the earlier part of our Neolithic revolution. For having a lot of money itself doesn't actually enhance your life. It doesn't feed you. Food does. Money does not make your car run. You may garner a little heat from it if you set it alight, but the only thing benefiting you there is the energy from a fire. You would get the same from kindling or newspaper. Personally, I would recommend an unread copy of the Daily Mail <laughs> as an, e an excellent fuel base for a nice big bonfire, but that is just me. <laughs> Money does nothing. It is the access to resources, be they food, water, housing, technological conveniences, transport, or any other life-enhancing object or service that makes for a better life. Millionaires aren't healthier, safer, or more well-fed because of their money. It is their access to abundance that makes their life so plush to begin with. Despite this truth, profit remains the primary focus and goal of a monetary system ahead of social concern and human well-being. And you can never have enough profit. Ask any CEO. For to gain a greater advantage over another in this system is to achieve a measure of security, to be rewarded by more money and in turn better access to what resources are available. And since none of us can live without resources, our very survival amid competition riddled marketplaces, now global in scale, is down to our ability to compete as unfairly as possible. If you're not growing, you're dying. So goes the old adage, without a hint of irony, that precisely the opposite is true if you're speaking about the survival of anything within a finite environment. The way that we've now structured our planet is on the basis of finite energy resources and inefficient use of space. I come back to John McMurtry, whose analysis of our present uh, global paradigm compares the situation very much to cancer. It grows for the sake of growth, ignoring limitations and thus its own future sustainability. Not only is it mathematically impossible, it is ecologically destructive to chase profit and growth. Follow this chain of events. We harvest food from an impoverished country because it is cheaper to do so, often to the detriment of that society in the form of poorly paid jobs and significant loss of the resources to foreign e economies. It is then transported to a facility which employs slave labor because it is cheaper, then derivative products are then uh, very often uh, transported yet again, produced and processed in another factory, then transported across the country to a distribution center, and then ultimately to the world. The reason for this, um, people in countries uh, where those fruits or items aren't naturally occurring are more likely to pay for them uh, in, in greater numbers. And also because this inefficient process is cheaper than fluid, efficient, streamlined production, a profit-motive orientated system demands inefficiencies, for those very inefficiencies are the cost savings to be made at the expense of the environment and the well-being of humanity. You can rail against polluting companies and carbon footprints all you want for destroying the planet. The bottom line is, the system any institution operates in requires this behavior. It is utterly expected when you really look at the logic of the market system. As of 1999, 99% of materials used in the production cycle in the USA end up as waste within six weeks. Every ton of garbage requires five tons of materials to produce it. And those five tons took 25 tons of materials harvested and mined from nature to produce it. It is a hugely wasteful system. Almost nothing that we produce or process actually ends up being used at all. I'm trying to convey to you 
just how inefficient this is. Uh, inefficiency is a good thing, a necessary thing, if you're operating in a monetary system. On a related note, where do you think this comes from? Other than inefficient systems applications in industrial processes, the vast consumer waste produced on a global scale is a huge danger to our survival. Not only does it pollute uh, our world with plastic, chemicals, and unsightliness, uh, it is a visual demonstration uh, that the resources we're burning through for the sake of profit are as vast as they are. The necessity of infinite growth-based consumption and, and profit-driven production of goods means three inescapable ramifications to the societies which operate under a monetary system. We must keep spending more on products, usually on a yearly basis, to satisfy cyclical profit cycles for companies that in turn <coughs> pay wages for labor. Those products must be made in the cheapest way possible from the cheapest possible materials in relation to their marketed cost to the consumer. And, of course, products produced within the monetary system must wear out, break down, require servicing, or become technologically or operationally obsolete within the time frame the company can economically endure before repeat business is required from the consumers. In 2004, it was estimated that 15 million mobiles are replaced annually, with owners updating them on average every 18 months. Updating is a nice word there. It means throwing one in the garbage and buying another one. In the time immediately following Christmas, it was estimated that 750,000 phones were dumped by consumers. Can you imagine what that figure might be today, six years later? This type of market behavior is called planned obsolescence, and it's been the primary mover of this infinite growth paradigm since the end of the Second World War. Companies like Apple need you to spend more and over and over and over again on similar or derivative products every year. Hence, we have multiple iPhones, iPods, iPads, iBoards, and iMats. This in turn means that all goods produced in a monetary system can only last as long as that company can endure it before a further or repeat sale needs to be made. The effect of this uh, waste is, is waste, inefficiency and incompatibility and a general disrespect and lackadaisical attitude to what we have come to perceive as throwaway consumerism. <coughs> This value program orientates members of society to disregard the importance of resources. We train ourselves not to see the vast implications while somehow entertaining the notion that we are more free by consuming more and more. It translates to a form of aspirational buying or keeping up with the Joneses. A fashion and style, uh, as fashion and style creep into the perceived values of the products in question. Adverts such as... Uh, there was one with a tagline that said, ah, are you ashamed of your old, old mobile phone? Do you remember that one? As though shame has any relevance to the benefits of mobile communications technology. Uh, it struck me as vastly incredible that people think about it that way. And in fact, on a related note, I, was in the, uh, I had the misfortune, of course, of being in the Apple store on Regent Street on the 27th, I think it was, when they were giving out the new iPad. I was just there to buy yet another lead that I need because things aren't compatible. And they were clapping clapping and cheering each new iPad customer as they walked in the door. It's just screaming like they were in a football match. Uh, it's absolutely remarkable that we've put so much value into it. I often think to myself, wouldn't it be wonderful if we felt that thrilled about advances in technology? The people in the streets were clapping and yelling, going, yeah, did you hear? We've got 20% better water efficiency. And while we're at this point, it is literally impossible to offer the best products at the lowest possible price. It's another advertising slogan that ignores the actual mechanisms that govern production and sale of any product in a competitive marketplace. Were Sony Ericsson to offer a truly robust, solid, upgrade flexible phone that was long lasting, feature accommodating, environmentally safe, recyclable as possible, and with a lifespan of as many years as technology allows to that point, it would be a necessary competent, uh, co a consequence of competition and market share hunting that another company will come along and make a slightly inferior phone at, for a slightly lower price in hope to catch that market share. This spiral then continues and branches out into multiple similarly produced items with decreasing lifespans and suboptimal te technologies for the sake of market share to begin with. This competition uh, that we're trained to prize so highly also produces another kind of waste. Thousands of different versions of the same thing will spring up, uh, duplicating the amount of resources we burn and use up on every imaginable product that we can be sold. It is by definition the most unsustainable method of production that there is. Even worse, we produce tons of products that aren't even necessary, simply so earnings can be made, because we now rely on money to begin with. Go into a pound shop or even Tesco's and count the amount of items that are absolutely necessary to the operational function of your life. 
it's less than 10% of the items, okay, if you ignore food. You know, we, we're given food anyway. Vast, vast aisles of bleach. <laughs> it's like, well, if you need bleach, just have bleach. You don't need to have all this duplication. And while we're uh, on buying and selling, the next ramification of a monetary system, of course, uh, includes the future of employment. Technological unemployment, uh, which is unemployment caused by the uh, use of machines uh, uh, as vehicles of labor, has continually and systematically forced relevant numbers of people out of every emerging sector for the past hundred years. Uh, in the words of Nobel uh, laureate uh, economist Vasily Leontiev, the role of humans as the most important factor uh, of production is bound to diminish in the same way that the role of horses in agricultural production was first diminished and then eliminated by the introduction of tractors. Our current economic employment market is basically broken down into three sectors. Agricultural, mining and fishing, things like that. Manufacturing, which is tangible goods and service, which is intangible goods. As near uh, universal social progression, all societies tend to follow uh, the developmental path which takes them from reliance on agriculture and extraction towards the development of manufacturing such as automobiles, textiles, shipbuilding, steel, and finally towards the more service-based structure. Naturally, the only uh, reason some uh, countries are farther behind the process than others has to do with the affordability of the technology required to move to the next level, irrespective of its uh, social system or political disposition. It's simply a scientific progression. So let's now consider this phenomenon using the United States as a proxy. In 1860, 60% of Americans worked in the agricultural sector. However, today, due to the advancement of machinery and automation, less than 1% do. Fortunately, those technological developments also gave rise to the emerging <coughs> industrial revolution, and by 1950, 33% of Americans were employed in the factory-based manufacturing sector. As of now, the continual advancements in machine automation <coughs> is less than 8%. So considering that only about 9% of Americans work in agricultural or manufacturing sectors now, where did everyone else go? Well, if you went to Z-Day or if you've uh, had a look at a fascinating book by Rifkin, Jeremy Rifkin called The End of Work, uh, which is where a lot of these numbers come from, uh, they all went to the service sector. Uh, the only thing that has served the U.S. <coughs> labor market, and in fact our labor market is exactly the same over here, uh, after the technological renovation of agricultural and then manufacturing sectors is the flight to the service industry. From 1950 to 2002, in the service sector, the uh, employment went from 59% to 82%. The service sector is the dominant employer of, of pretty much the world today, actually, with, uh, with uh, you know, all other industrial countries. Uh, of course, this begs the question, is this sector susceptible to the wrath of technological unemployment as well? Well, it, of course, it's not insusceptible. Uh, with the advent of uh, increasing versatile computer technologies, which I'm sure you're all very much better versed in than I am, uh, we're seeing job displacement once again, this time in all service industries. The replacement of tellers and cashiers with kiosks, the use of automated voice systems for phone calls, uh, even the Internet has redefined retail, not to mention uh, full kiosk systems in physical marketplaces, advanced uh, food prep by machines, even research by automation is being done from statistical modeling to lab experiments. As economist Stephen Roach has warned, the service sector has lost its, uh, its role as America's unbridled engine of job creation. As a unique example, in Germany, the first fully automated restaurant is in operation. In fact, it's old news now. This came about, I think it was at the end of... 2008, certainly by 2009, it had been going very well. It uses kiosks for order and payment, and the food is then served by fully mechanized systems. There are zero wait staff. There is no uh, reason this and uh, more could not be done with every single eating establishment in the world. In fact, if, we're, if one were to think creatively about the application of technology as it currently exists to the entire service sector, uh, you could probably wait, wipe out most of the jobs overnight. The only reason it hasn't been done is because the focus of society is backwards when it comes to social progress. To illustrate this more, let's stop thinking about technology in terms of employment for a moment and consider it from the angle of productivity. The most incredible relationship of all, uh, is, uh, of all this is that the more technological unemployment increases, the more productive things become. In the G7 advanced material uh, indu industrialized countries, Employment in manufacturing, in manufacturing has been dropping, but manufacturing output has been rising. Here's the chart. Uh, you can see it's a, a practically inverse correlation. There's a wonderful quote from uh, Bruce Bartlett. He said, uh, 
The truth is that U.S. manufacturing is doing quite well in every aspect, uh, except in the number of people it employs. Furthermore, the economists would judge the health or sickness of any industry based solely on employment, uh, few uh, would, would uh, do, uh, based on employment. By that standard, agriculture has been the sickest industry of all for decades because employment has declined, although farm productivity rose dramatically in the past century. Industrial health is better measured by output, productivity, profitability, and wages. Unfortunately, this person is forgetting one universal thing. If human laborers are displaced, they cannot obtain purchasing power. If they cannot obtain purchasing power, they cannot fuel the economy by consumption. So on that level, it doesn't matter how productive we are, no one will be able to buy anything. This phenomenon uh, is not new. It's called the contradiction of capitalism. And I, I hesitate to use this phrase because, of course, I'm talking about the monetary system generally, not just capitalism. Of course, that can mean anything you want it to, and it often does. For um, not only is the obsolescence of human labor uh, the obsolescence of the human consumption uh, consumer, the high level of output generated by technological efficiency makes the corporate motivation to pursue such advances very strong, even though it is economically self-defeating over time. In other words, regardless of the level of productivity, if people don't have jobs, they can't buy anything. This very fact alone, that productivity is inverse to employment is in, all sectors, in all sectors, should be enough to warrant a deliberate shift from the focus of human labor to a system where technology is given the highest priority. The system is literally denying peak production in a world where those one billion we mentioned are starving. Um, I think that's probably the most despotic thing I can think of. Another damaging culmination of a society operating under a monetary system is the propensity for generating established institutions. By this I mean the self-reinforcing need uh, for any company or institution with power or vested interests to preserve that same power and investment to the exclusion of any and all new or differing information. It is, on a smaller scale, uh, the same self-defending uh, mind lock of the world, most of the world's popula population has towards alternatives to a monetary system. Consider this. If you founded a drug company to produce cancer treatments, employed staff, attracted shareholders uh, who invest in your company and expect a return on that investment, you must do everything to maintain the viability of your enterprise. You are, in fact, a vested interest in cancer. Were there a cheap, easily administered, non-toxic cure for a wide variety of cancers to come along, you are forced into a position of fighting tooth and claw to suppress, outsell, and block this alternative medicine. The need for cyclical returns, growing profit, and the need to maintain a competitive edge means increased prices and the maintaining of the status quo. It doesn't matter if it's bad for people or not. The radical change in the status quo means ditching practices Develop, uh, develop drugs and research has been uh, heavily funded on and which employs large numbers of people. And even if the jump was made to a singular, cheap and easily applied treatment, prices would remain artificially high to maintain the profits in the bottom line you already inherited from the old system. Immediately, this puts the treatment out of the reach of the poorer sections of society, exactly those in the more unequal countries uh, who absolutely require it. And, uh, you know, those in more unequal countries have higher rates of illness as well. In a sustainable society uh, formulated around the logic of a monetary system, there would be, no, no, be nothing to hold back developmental uh, implementation of anything um, once it's been tested thoroughly. There could be no established institutions. New methods would immediately be implemented into society and no monetary institution to thwart the change due to their self-preserving um, nature. Prior evidence of this kind of sick self-preservation to the detriment of the population easily fades from collective public memory. However, here are some examples uh, of the outright lies that various institutions have perpetrated to preserve their own operational safety, regardless of social concern. Has anyone seen these? Uh, Lucky Strike are the, almost the best example of this, actually. If you look, there's a great uh, there's a guy on YouTube who keeps posting 1950s adverts. It's surprising how many of them are, are Lucky Strike. Filled with facts, evidence, and dead-faced, grinning physicians with rosy cheeks, Lucky Strike clearly saw the benefits of employing pseudoscience to convince countless people of the alleged safety and superiority of their cigarettes. Rather than withdraw this poison from the marketplace, the act of reinforcement of sales through advertising is obvious. And rather than any government banning outright the sale of 
deadly toxins being sold to their own voters, the tax garnered from their sales, which grows year upon year, proves to be the dominant social mechanism in the process that selects this cultural attribute for self-preservation. Well, how about this? Mike, welcome to the show. We appreciate you being on tonight. Thanks for the invitation, Joe. Okay, let's talk about the rat of the week. Why is Bear Corporation the rat of the week? Internal documents show that after this company positively, absolutely knew that they had a medication that was infected with the AIDS virus, they took the product off the market in the U.S. and then they dumped it in France, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. The medicine's called Factor 8. It was an, inject an injection medicine that was used for hemophiliacs, mostly children. Children. Children had been born with an incurable disease. Hold on, hold on, Mike. So, hold on, hold on. So you're yeah. telling me that Bear knew that this drug was infected with the AIDS virus. They yanked it from the market in America, and then they dumped it in markets overseas? They had to figure out a way, Joe, to make a profit on a product that they could not sell in America. So they made a huge profit. They, jumped, they dropped the product in Japan, Spain, and France. By the way, Joe, government officials in France that allowed that to happen actually had to go to prison for in America, not one corporate executive for this company has been indicted or even criminally investigated by our Justice Department. Why not? What, you, you're telling me that these people that dumped this AIDS-tainted blood in foreign countries yes. who killed children have not been have not been taken to task in the it's, United States? It's, it's worse than that. The U.S. government allowed it to happen. The FDA allowed this to happen. And now the government is completely looking the other way. Thousands of innocent hemophiliacs have died from the AIDS virus. And not only they're dying, their family members are dying because they're becoming infected with the disease. This company knew absolutely that they had a problem with the product. They knew that, that it was infected with AIDS. They dumped it because they wanted to turn this disaster into a profit. It's Mike, pretty... Mike I, I, I want to read to you what Bear told the New York Times about this scandal. They said Bear behaved responsibly, ethically, and humanely. Decisions made nearly two decades ago were based on the best scientific information of the time and were consistent with the regulations in place. That sounds like a lot of legal mumbo jumbo. Now you say you have internal documents that show that they knew that this this drug they were dumping was tainted with the AIDS drug? The or, or the AIDS virus? The documents show that there was no question that this company absolutely understood the risk that, that they knew that it was that it was contaminated. It wasn't a possibility. They knew it was contaminated. Americans were dying from the product before it was pulled off the market. The only reason it was pulled, pulled off the market is because lawyers found the documents and showed it to the government and finally the government said you can't sell it here but then the government allowed them to dump it in Spain, France and Japan. That's uh, amazing. Pretty, that, that's just amazing. Well, I, I, want, I, will, I want to read to you what the New York Times said and this is an investigation that, they, that they, they also did and they said the federal government was part of the problem while the Food and Drug Administration told the company not to ship the drugs overseas the man responsible for the drug supply quote ask that the issue be quietly solved without alerting the Congress, the med medical community, and the public. This is a cover-up, and our Congress is not doing anything. What should Americans do? Have you ever wondered what today's Lucky Strike products are? What, are you, what is your asbestos? What is your HIV infected commercial medicine? What is our generation's DDT? What is the thalidomide of now? pushed as safe and sound, rushed through production without proper testing or understanding the effects due to the profit system. Commercial drugs have life span, uh, patent lifespans of seven years, including trials, and it takes only a cursory glance at uh, uh, modern medicine to see stories like Vioxx and realize how important, um, uh, which is more important out of human concern and the profit motive. What is being sold to you now that is self-evidently harmful ineffective and deliberately expensive. What today, tonight, will you consume that is developed to solve a non-existent problem such as restless leg syndrome or produced and tested in the cheapest way that can be, like Dell computers, I'm sorry, I, I've got a Dell as well, David. <laughs> um, you know, or uh, marketed to you as absolutely necessary like SSRI antidepressants or carcinogenic food colorings which are only there to make the food more attractive so you'll buy it. But why do we forget these histories of socially offensive behavior and outright danger, these negative retroactions in our societal construct? Are we stupid? No, it's not that. Well, many people regard the corporations as responsible in abstraction, almost as separate individualized entities. 
Corporate fines or the public offering up of CEOs for punishment in a semi-ritualistic manner makes people feel a misguided sense that justice has been done and that we can now move on now that the offending bad apples have been removed, that an aberrant problem has been rooted out of the system. Yet the root of the issue is not an isolated behavior by some rogue corporation or individual, for the damaging behaviors are themselves a generation of the monetary system to begin with. A much stronger reason for the attributes of our, uh, our kind of attrition of our memories and our awareness uh, of these kinds of failures is down to the media companies, when, which automatically filter out negative stories because of corporate ownership, the need to attract advertising from the very companies they might be exposing, uh, or editorial censorship, driven and informed by worldviews already indoctrinated into the logic of the market system as it currently is structured. You will not read about the vast corporate crimes in history class, just as you will not be taught the fractional reserve banking system in economics. Ultimately, it is of little value to the self-sustaining nature of the system or is a direct threat to its dogma, as John McMurtry might have put it, and is just ignored. And it's usually at this point that many believe that uh, greater governmental intervention or regulation or even lack of government regulation or intervention or some mysterious and detail lacking reform would solve this issue. That a true free market would somehow work out for the better, that what we're seeing now is not the true free market. Well, quite apart from the fact that the ecological and socially offensive detriments we've already outlined would continue untouched or, and completely unchecked, one must realize there is no such thing as the free market. Governments are simply extensions of the corpora corporations and the competition advantage driven marketplace. This is why we see so many politicians going on to be heads of vast private businesses or directors of the World Bank or the IMF, or worse, lobbying and non-governmental agencies whose singular qualification is access and power and connections. Monopoly and cartel are the logical ends and goals of any corporate entity in a competition-based monetary system. For example, let's say I open an elect electronics store. I could probably do it outside given the, uh, the problems we had here today. And at that time, there are three other stores in my area, and I have to compete with them. As time move for, uh, moves forward, I would streamline my comp competitive strategies and reduce overheads in such a way that my store becomes the dominant, most affordable contributor of a certain set of items, and everyone in town flocks to my store over the, uh, over the others for such items. Due to this, two of the other three stores go out of business and leave town. So, now at this point, it's just my store and the little other competitor in my region. Since my profits have been so good, I decide to attempt to acquire or buy the competing store in town. They agree, so I purchase that store, put my logo on it, and boom, we have a regional monopoly. Likewise, let's assume I didn't purchase the other store, but rather became friends and then partners with them, and thus figured out ways to allow for both of us to flourish in a non-competitive way. Well, then you have a cartel. In other words, business is based in part on a gaming strategy to win market share and hence profit. Therefore, it is a natural gravitation to seek dominance in your sector or industry. And the highest level is monopoly and cartel. It is a natural progression of the free market system to become as dominant and powerful as possible. There is no corporation in the world that would not want to have a complete monopoly. Now, a lot of people believe motivation is spurred by the promise of monetary reward and that without money, nothing would ever be done. Well, it is a remarkable truth that modern life is based in large part on the sum of achievements of very few people, many of whom uh, had heavily altruistic ideas and who died poor. Those who license, buy, and steal their ideas to make products and services for profit, however, are feeding off those other people's ideas for quite different reasons. Nikola Tesla, who was the inventor of wireless technology and one of the inventors of radio. I say one of because there was actually a large debate as to who exactly produced it first. Broadly speaking, Marconi, Tesla, and a few other people uh, developed the technology at the time. We have Tesla to thank for the alternating current, which powers the world. <laughs> uh, he's, um, it's incredible he's forgotten. He is the reason this room is even usable today. And Tesla was not doing it for the money. In fact, later in his life, Tesla had the, uh, he built the Wardenclyffe Tower, uh, which was going to become uh, one large hub of electricity that would be transferred wirelessly around the globe. It was actually part of a system. J.P. Morgan, our good friend, the richest and most powerful man of that time, was a financier of the Tesla Broadcasting System, as it was called. The tower was designed as a world communications center, and Tesla added to the project, uh, 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 and Tesla added to the project in that the tower would also be used uh, for transmitting electrical energy without wires to the entire globe. 
Tesla wanted to saturate the globe with electricity as a dynamo so that everyone on the surface of the globe could uh, obtain electricity, uh, uh, electrical lights just by sticking wires into the ground and an electric bulb would light up. Has anyone seen the, um, the Prestige? Yeah, that's not science fiction. Tesla managed to do that. Um, the reason we don't see it now, JP Morgan heard about the Tesla project and, and he was asked, uh, and he asked, how can we get money? These are his exact words. How can we get money from the electricity which Tesla is supplying to every part of the world? After that, Morgan cut the funds and the tower was never finished. Tesla died of a heart attack, heart failure, sorry, in 1943, alone in his room in the New Yorker hotel, broke. Not only was Tesla not motivated by money, he was actually hamstrung by it. And so are we, years later, still seeing sites like this. So, the next time you're wrestling with your cables behind your computer, or hear stories of power lines destroying houses, or large rolling blackouts because the power lines broke down, remember by which mechanism we were denied globally available wireless energy, all created by a man who simply wants to make a better world, and who paid the price for it. Is Tesla one in a billion? Evidently not. British inventor Emily Cummins invented a solar-powered fridge for use in hot and, and arid countries in, the, in a potting shed. It doesn't require electricity, it's self-powering. These students invented self-powering biosensors that detect dangerous toxins. Um, bear that one in mind for later on, that's quite important. Some students in North Carolina invented a textile that blocks radiation, making it possible for astronauts to survive on the, the dangerous levels of radiation in space. It wasn't NASA that fixed that, some students in North Carolina. And an ignorant machine, this is my favorite one, given raw data, deduced N Newtonian laws all by itself. We aren't all that far away from Deep Thought, the giant supercomputer in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, who was so powerful that when first switched on and started with, I think, therefore I am, it uh, deduced the existence of income tax and rice pudding before they could turn it off again. All we need is unhampered scalability for the same thing. We've already created exactly what Adams was talking about. Or have a look at the correlation of successful patents filed as opposed to income inequality in our own lifetime. In countries where there is a smaller gap between the richest and poorest, the number of patents is much higher than those in which, uh, in which massive stratification, like the UK or the US, uh, exists. Were we truly equal, truly able to access resources on a level playing field, our innovation would skyrocket tomorrow, based on the trends we're seeing even now. That line hasn't been drawn by me, by the way. That's a math mathematical inference. Uh, it's not designed by Wilkinson and Pickett either. That, that's a byproduct of the, of the statistics themselves. Imagine how many more Teslas there would be. Were we not hampered by merely the best education that we can just about afford and an education system that isn't purely geared to conditioning us for the 9-to-5 uh, wage slavery of a job that, on average, produces nothing of societal significance and the exposure to low-grade media designed to make us buy rather than think. I have absolutely no reservations in this. The human race is brilliant. We are massively inventive, naturally curious, and have, in spite of the hamstringing effects of the, of the profit system, designed and invented incredible systems of abundance. It's time to put these systems into effect, replacing the poisonous, irrelevant, and detrimental systems of profit, self-interest, and duplicative competition, ecological mismanagement, and the lack of general awareness for our needs and goals for survival on this planet. This is what the Venus Project proposes. We have, and have had for a long time, the necessary technological, technological wherewithal to build systems of abundance generation right now not in some misty future, we could do it today. Why is there a water shortage anywhere on this planet when it is covered mostly in water? We can produce desalination plants that work off the sun's energy. Don't think it can be done? Where do you think clouds come from? We haven't done it systematically because there's no money in solving a problem and producing abundance so massive that it doesn't require money. Think of Tesla. Um, like Tesla's vision of free energy for all, the only reason it doesn't exist today is because scarcity equals profit by our present logic. So, what do we do to get from here to there? What is proposed and how do we do it? Here are the fundamental concepts and strategies towards solving these issues as we, as we see as direly pressing in our world. It's called a resource-based economy. First off, we move from a growth economy to a steady-state economy. We do not have the resources or the environmental freedom to keep using, consuming, wasting, and poisoning our resource pool. Not only do we have to move away from this paradigm, we must outright flee it. 
we call for an absolute end to the monetary system. The scarcity and waste we see around us is being generated, created by us, not some intrinsic process of nature or some human nature, the assertions of which are religious in nature and absurd when you think about our evident adaptability. The use of money is no longer relevant to us, as we have thoroughly discussed, and it's extremely detrimental. Second, we must move away, uh, move from a primitive competition based <coughs> invention system to a collaborative system. Not only are all goods produced in our current system inherently inferior due to the need to maintain a competitive cost basis in the marketplace, but the competition system also generates large amounts of corruption and yes, the incentive to compete <coughs> does produce improved goods and services to a certain degree, but that positive is completely overshadowed by the planned obsolescence, pointless duplication and general environmental detachment created by the necessity to stay ahead of someone else. Imagine for a moment if the top engineers of the major car companies, rather than competing and uh, got together and decided to collaborate on making the best car possible to a given point in time, imagine if we establish an incentive system that pulls people together to create the best, rather than compete and produce inherently inferior sorry, I'm miles behind now, there we go, uh, inferior, inferiority. Think about that, an open source world with all lines coming together to produce and improve goods so everyone can benefit. The progress would be unbelievable, not to mention it would save tremendous amounts of resources for there's no longer a need for duplication inherent in the corporate uh, competing mechanism. Third, we move from our piecemeal dispersed industrial methods to a centrally planned system of streamlined functionality. Is it me, or is it absolutely insane that we import strawberries from Brazil, or bananas from Ecuador, or water from Fiji, when all of these things can be produced locally? As Jacques Fresco will describe, oh, I'm reading the wrong bit, as, as he does describe in regard to his city systems, everything is as self-contained as possible in a resource-based economy. Also, as another example, consider the general uh, route of production from mining materials, uh, creating preliminary components to assembly the components to distribution. You'll find that all these factories are all over the place in different states, in different countries, in different parts of the world. And we're all these uh, components to, uh, you know, they get transported around. We can do that all from one place. The earth is a system and it must be treated as such. There are resources all over pla uh, planet earth and we must therefore create a system that uh, can monitor these, uh, these uh, global resources um, uh, in, a, in a holistic way. The first step would be a full survey of the Earth's natural resources. If you don't know what you have, you can't make an intelligent decision about management. We must first understand the full range and capacity of the earthly components in order to derive inference as to our capabilities. There are many natural resources to be considered on planet Earth, but for the sake of quickly showing the train of thought, uh, let's just consider energy. Since um, energy is the fuel of society, it makes perfect sense to begin with. Uh, so we scan, analyze the Earth, listing all the relevant energy locations and potentials. The potential, of course, to clarify is always uh, based uh, in part on the current state of technology uh, for harnessing. I say current technology for harnessing because in some areas the potentials uh, is based extensively on our ability to actually utilize it. For example, solar energy has a dramatic potential but is still greatly underutilized as the technology has been very inefficient so far. But with the advent of nanotechnology, uh, we can see a, a possible a exponential increase in this potential. So it is uh, contingent upon the quality of our methods. I don't have time to spend all of the, uh, you know, spend too much on this interesting topic, but if you research the trends of nanotech applied to solar radiation harnessing, it becomes clear that solar energy alone could power the entire world thousands of times over. Moving on, we then have this raw data. We need to rate uh, each resource based on its renewability, pollution output, and everything that factors into it, uh, way into the degree of sustainability. Those sources which uh, have the most negative retroactions are given least priority in utilization. For example, since fossil fuels are non-renewable and can pollute the environment, and uh, given the tremendous power of geothermal, wave, wind, and solar combined, I might find that there is no reason to burn fossil fuels at all. Once realized, we move to the third step, distribution and monitoring. Energy distribution and infrastructure projects would logically be formulated based on technological possibility and proximity to sources. In other words, if we have wind energy being utilized in Asia, we are likely not going to deliver that energy to Latin America. So distribution parameters would be self-evident based on the current state of technology and proximity looked at practically. 
Likewise, active resource monitoring uh, done through Earth sensors, and that brings us back to that self-powered sensor system. This actually would run itself. It wouldn't need energy in the first place. Um, Earth sensors and computers would, be allow, uh, would allow a constant awareness of the rate of use, the rate of depletion, the rate of renewal, and any other parameter relevant to know uh, in order to maintain a balanced load. If the scarcity of any raw resource is going uh, to occur, we could forecast that well in advance, which is what we're not doing, for example, with oil now. In fact, Hewlett Packard develops, uh, is developing actually a wireless sensing system to uh, acquire extremely high resolution seismic data on land. This is exactly the direction that we need to move in. Uh, and the next level is simply maximizing the scalability of this technology in regard to creating a monitoring system for the entire planet, uh, including parameters from extraction to production, distribution. We must monitor and understand the rates of depletion and generation of all Earth's resources, and in turn, our actions will always be cognizant of their environmental impact. So what do we have so far? We have the locations of the energy resources, we have the, uh, the uh, output potentials and the distribution qualifiers based on statistical usage, technological harnessing and proximity, and finally we have a system of active resource monitoring which reports the state of the energy supply, rates of usage and any other relevant trends. In other words, we've created a system, a systems approach to the energy management on this planet. The system is comprised of real-time data and statistics, the process of unfolding is biased not only not, not on a person or a group's opinion, not on the whims of a corporation or government, but on the natural law and research. In other words, once we establish the interest that survival and hence sustainability is our goal, which I hope everyone here would think is quite important, each parameter to consider in regard of resource management becomes self-evident. It's called ar arriving at decisions as opposed to making them, which is a subjective act based on incom incomplete information and often cultural bias and I can't imagine what uh, our Prime Minister is going to decide. Uh, I don't know what he would use as his reference point. So using this uh, energy model as a, a procedural example, uh, this systems approach can be applied to every other earthly resource and quantifier. We survey, find potential, qualify for negative retroactions and apply modern technology to harness, distribute and monitor the most logically advanced holistic way possible. A computer database and management program would be the logical means to navigate these issues where all the attributes we have discussed are fed in with uh, strategic uh, computation applied. And since the goal is maximum uh, efficiency, the automation of uh, adjustments becomes very simple. For example, uh, let's say we have two geothermal power plants in the same region, each outputting in tandem the required amount of energy. One day there's a problem the output of one plant drops by 30%. This would be seen by the monitoring system, uh, monitoring system and the other power plant's output would be automatically increased by 30%. It is reactive, just like the nervous system in your body. No reason to vote on it, no reason to debate it in Congress or in the Parliament. It's automatic because it is self-evident. We want to eliminate subjectivity currently dominant in today's uh, society um, and replace politics uh, with a system of physical reference. The possibilities of our technology are absolutely profound. Even as unintuitive as it may seem, complex surgery is on pace for full automation and based on the pattern will likely become much more reliable than the human hand. In fact, people in the future will be appalled at the way that we allowed someone as irrational, technically inexact, and with as varied results as a human being to operate directly on the most valuable, subtle, and advanced machine we have, a human being. The bottom line is that it is socially irresponsible not to recognize this pattern and maximize the potential. We do not have the luxury of Luddite romanticism when it comes to the goals of a material abundance and sustainability. We must follow the trends as they come about. The final issue to, to, to talk about before we leave it is uh, ownership. Uh, ownership actually hampers access. Uh, we have less because we own more. The best example is cars. All right? If you require a car for whatever reason, the car is made available for you. When you get to your destination, the satellite system in a car should, we already have development, should be able to send that car off to the next person who needs it. Uh, as opposed to sitting in some parking lot, wasting time and space for likely 80% of its time. This is what we do now. Uh, it's because we have built our systems around this kind of ownership that we actually have individual access is a lot less. And we must realize how many resources will be saved, enabling access, abundance for all, when we stop this destructive idea of everyone owning one of everything. Remember, property is this outgrowth of scarcity. The only reason we own things is because there might not be enough to go around. 
Um, in fact, if you think about it, property is a huge burden. No longer will a person need to live in one place. One could travel the world uh, constantly, getting what one needs as one moves along. Anything needed is obtained without restriction. We hoard things in our current system uh, because you know, we have houses full of junk, uh, because we're afraid to get rid of it, because we know that you know, they have some kind of monetary value. And again, there's no reason for this kind of uh, abuse, for there's nothing to gain. You can't steal things uh, in a society where there is open access to everything. So, perhaps you think that surpassing the monetary system is too radical, that it's pie in the sky, it's too futuristic. Well, you know what I think is radical? Designing and presiding over a system based on infinite growth and which relies upon inefficiency and duplicated effort and inferior throwaway products in a finite world. We have to sell more, buy more, and accrue more debt and produce more and more tons of waste in order for this system to function. Not only that, the successful function of the current system inherently means the few getting richer while the many get poor. Who will buy your products when there is so little work that the majority of humanity is unemployed? Who will use your services when the most of us are starving? Yet we cannot keep producing more and more in a world with ever-shrinking resources and limited societal development, development hamstrung by the need for every institution to preserve its status quo to begin with. That's the most radical thing I've ever heard of. It is demonstrably unsustainable. It is inhuman. In fact, it is anti-human. And while we hear this word unsustainable a lot, it's overused again and again by the media, let me remind you again what exactly it means. It means, in our global society, based on deliberate inefficiency, waste, pollution, and massive social stratification, the things we do right now will reach a point where it will not support human life the way we need it to. We must reorientate our structures to support the population we have already and which we are about to have. We are only successful in a society if we take a hard look at the only thing which has ever been important, and that is the survival of the entire species as a whole, and to align our operations within the necessary laws and balances that our nature requires. That's the true meaning of evolution. I refuse to live in a society like this. I refuse to sit on top of the top 10% of this world, uh, standing by while billions of mirror images of myself suffer and die for no good reason other than profit and artificial boundaries. No longer will I like to quietly tolerate the suffering of almost all of the only race that I'm a member of, on the only planet in the known universe that I can presently inhabit. I do not accept that this is as good as it gets. This is as bad as it gets. We need to roundly reject this paralyzing, limiting, divisionary, fraudulent mess we laughingly refer to as economics. It is irrelevant and, in fact, in direct opposition to our survival. And it is stunting our staggering and subtle, fantastic, unlimited potential. I'm sorry, it'll have to go. You know, if you consider yourself forward thinking, you'll have learned to be able to look back at the present from the future. The future population of this Earth can look back one day at our present tense and see one of two things. They could see that we recklessly destroyed ourselves and each other, or they can see that we made it. In the future, they are already looking at our living group, and I want them to see that we did make it. We have to make it. Thank you.